fucking down here somewhere. If you go through this again, we could see these as processes on a system. And in operations one through four, O2 is created, which could be a, a malicious script, which P1, who might be a malicious user or, or process on the system, generates. And then in operations five through seven, somehow tricks P2 into executing this script. Um, operation eight, P1 gets rid of the evidence by deleting the script. And operation nine, maybe the result of executing the script, P2, who may have privileged um, uh, was it privileged runtime in, no. Who may have super user privileges, let's put it that way, um, spawns a new process. Who then, in the next operations, executes another file that was left there on the system by maybe some other malicious person or who knows what. And then receives some information from P3 upon which he performs some bad things to P4. So if you interpret the labels, the A, B, C, maybe as some sort of location information, then when examining the system and you have P5 still running, you have a notion of which locations actually played a part in this. Plus, P4 also receives this information and then maybe can make some conclusions from that. So um, in order to make any statements about my, my model, I, I had to extend it a little bit. And basically, I partitioned the set of principles on a system into those that can inherently generate a label and those who can't. And if, if there's more than one of such groups, then basically, I require that you, you are able, by looking at the label, to say which group did it come from. Um, plus our label update function must actually preserve the labels that, that we are propagating. And in the example, I used the set union already. Um, plus I am defining what I call a potential information exchange path between two principles on a system. And as an informal definition is we have from this um, sequence of the total operations, this is a subset of those operations that directly lead to information being passed along. So it could be P1 write, writes to an object, another principle reads from the object, and then that principle finally communicates with, with P2, and that's the direct chain of how the information was, was exchanged, or potentially. Because remember in the beginning with um, undecidability, this is how information could have flown on the system. And um, basically, I require for that information exchange path that the read and write operations add up, meaning that if there's a channel open between two principles and there's already data in the channel before we write again to the channel with a different label set, then all that previous information has to be read before the new label set gets updated with the, with the principle through the read operation. And given these, these um, extensions to the model, I can give you these two properties, and the third bullet is just a, a direct consequence of that. So if a label is bound at a principle P1, and there exists a potential information exchange path from P1 to P2, then the label will be present as part of P2's set. Furthermore, if, there is, if, if you find a label at P2, and P2 is not a principle that could have generated this label itself, um, then information must have been exchanged between P2 and the principle who could have generated this label. And as a consequence from that, um, we can see the absence of a label as a guarantee that no information was exchanged between a principle that could have generated a label um, through the channels that are supported 
in an actual implementation and not considering covert channels. So quickly, two case studies. Um, one is user influence. So we take the system processes as our principles and all the shared resources on a system are our objects. These are files, logs, global variables, whatever you have available on the system. The label set is actually the set of user IDs, which is a fixed size on a system because user, um, user IDs, I think they're, they're bound at kernel compilation or something, the number. And the actual binding of the label takes place when a user logs in through there are various programs who can do that, but usually it boils down to just a system call, set UID on Linux or set login on, on the BSD family. So basically the group of principles who can generate a label is limited to those who provide a login. Um, second case study, origin information. Um, we have the same subject world as in the previous example, processes on a system and shared object. Um, but the labels now need to uniquely identify the source of the connection. And this could be a network, uh, a network identifier. You can use the source port, destination port, and source addresses for TCP and UDP. Or you can even think of using information such as GPS information to, to convey origin here. And the binding in this case takes place when, when you accept data from a network. And this would be for TCP, the accept system call, or receive from for UDP. And this actually poses a problem for the current way that servers operate. Because the current way is you, you have a server who listens on a port, then the connection is accepted, then the server for, uh, forks the child process who handles the connection. And if we do that, then each time the server accepts a, uh, a, a connection, the label gets bound to the server process. So it's, it's very likely that this needs to be changed so that we can have an atomic accept, fork, and bind label to the child in order not to clutter up the, the server process with too much information. Um, I'm currently working on a proof of concept implementation by modifying the FreeBSD 4.2, uh, 4.12 kernel. Um, I have a fixed set of possible labels. I'm primarily focusing on user IDs right now. Um, we have a global table of, of what the labels are and we only need to store a small vector um, of labels directly in the process table. So these are just, it's a bit vector of, of what's, what's there. Um, files are stored in a special file, which means we, we have them all in a central location and can easily determine which file has which label and also which label is contained in which <laughs> files. Um, the disadvantage of that is, is an added overhead when actually doing the updating by having to access the file. And um, for the update function, we only need to bitwise oring all these vectors in, in order to, to make the updates. Um, modifying system calls for the open, close, read, and write um, instances for both sockets and files. And I think pipes are actually a subset of, of one of these two. Um, the user information, as I described earlier, is bound at the set login system call and the network information at accept and, and receive from calls. Um, other applications of this work, other than the forensic information I mentioned earlier, is network traceback, especially in conjunction with, uh, with the network identifiers. But you can use labels for access control as well. So you can say, Similar to, to the owner group world permissions you have on a system, you can certainly group locations together as well, like location labels, and 